No, no, that is not. I do not have a fascination with evens and odds. I need when I turn up the volume in my car, it has to be at a certain number. I don't know why. <laughs> are you are you being serious? No, I'm being serious. I'm telling you, it's an OCD <laughs> thing. It's like I don't yeah. turn it up. I don't turn it up by odds. I turn it up by evens. Like if I'm on twelve. This is how my stereo in my car works. Like, if you have somebody in the car with you and you just want music on, but you don't want it too loud, it's at 10. It's not too bad. But if I'm by myself, I'll turn it up to 12 or 14. Never once can I tell you that I've ever had it at 13 or 15 or 17 or 19. It just wouldn't happen. It always has to be even. I'm sure people have way stranger OCD things, but that just happens to be mine. Yeah, I'm sure. It's like, okay, fine. I have to walk in and out of a door at least six times before I leave. <laughs> the, the number thing is what I'm talking about. That is the weirdest. No, I don't have to do that. I'm not Howard Hughes. I do keep my urine in bottles, but that's only for future use because I'm a, uh, what do they call those guys? The survivor types, the apocalypto guys? Weirdos? You know what I'm talking about? The, the people that like have bomb uh, shelters and survivalist i don't know there's a name for him you know what i'm saying i don't know the name and i just want to uh if you are suffering from ocd and you're listening to this podcast just know that we actually know that it's a serious disease and we're sorry we're speaking of it lightheartedly well that's fine they're not going to go away they have to they're completists they're going to keep listening to this podcast because they have (laughs) so don't worry about it that's that's with me if i start something i gotta keep listening we're not going to lose them. Okay, that's that's very funny, and I like that a lot. <laughs> um, real quick, uh, hi, everyone. This is Aaron and Justin Talk Sequels, a s- podcast uh, about movie sequels and their impact and blah, blah, blah. Oh, uh, anyway. not really. I, I take it you didn't really enjoy the third one, and, and I just feel like it's for, so forgettable. All right, so is it time to Yeah, talk let's get into it? that. Let's just, let's okay. just bang this out. So <sighs> we're talking today about the third and final live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. And you can almost say that because all the further movies were CGI. And this was the last tactile, real Ninja Turtles film where the turtles... Are you going to be messing with the hamster the whole time? Because this is really distracting. Is it distracting? (laughs) I just, I'm worried that it's going to screw up my audio. I mean, I can't hear it. Okay. But whatever. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, Everybody, uh, Justin's got a hamster. All right. Yeah. Deal with it. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) We're just going to ignore the <laughs> animal in the background running on a wheel that I gave him yeah. so that he doesn't get bored and eat his arm off. Well, I mean, can you put him somewhere else? Like, does he have a cage? Oh, good point. Him? I'm just going to move him. <laughs> there you go. Did you just ask if the hamster has a cage? Yeah. Like, I, what I meant to ask is that does he have an easily movable cage or is it some giant fish it actually monstrosity that encompasses the move? entire house? There's a series <laughs> like, of like, I am in. <laughs> essentially yeah way uh, off topic uh this is why teenage... i just want to say this is why editing is so important to our podcast yeah you are good at editing editing the podcast if people knew what we actually sounded like you take my accent away completely if most of you don't realize that i have a very strong south african accent south african yeah and well, you know, it's Adobe uh, Premiere. I actually just use Premiere to edit it, uh, not like an audio software. And they have a, um accent dampener effect. <laughs> so I always put that on you. Question. <laughs> Look, we've already been rambling, but I just want to make a quick comment. We're going too far with calling out every time somebody does something wrong ever in, in society. Media. Yes. Yep. I thought you'd come to that realization. Do you know? Because I was at that realization a long time ago, and I feel like people are. I, w- I would join that crowd of like dissenters and conservatives that feel like we've gone too far, but I am not one of those guys, I promise. And see, that's the important part right there, because conservatives, I don't want to say conservatives, the far right. I would say likes, far right, yeah, that'd be fair. Likes to point out every time anybody gets canceled and say oh they're yeah canceling us but it turns out that the far left is equally as guilty Mm. and what we are no longer doing is meeting in the middle i think they're both crazy the far right and the far left yeah and they don't see how crazy they are i think the far right actually does see how crazy they are oh i think it's a plan and they know it yeah yeah but the far left thinks they're actually doing good and that's the trouble. And they don't even... It's its worse when you don't realize it, I think. You're you are more of an asshole when you don't realize you're an asshole. But if you are an asshole, at least you're like, well, at least he knows he's an asshole. <laughs> so we crossed a weird line 
where I'm starting to have issues with constantly calling out everybody for the tiniest thing. Mm -hmm. A video went viral of a teacher who dressed up in stereotypical Indian garb Mm. to teach a mathematical thing. The video is just surreal. She goes on for a very long time just doing, like, a dance. And she's white, I take it. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, it's questionable, sure. But then NBC News is interviewing a Native American activist talking about the harm that that TikTok video does to Mm. young Native American children. And I don't buy it. Yeah. you know, there might be somebody harmed, and we might have to cut this all, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm i on the fence about that stuff, because I, I, there's so many facets to it. Like, number one, <laughs> she should know better. What are you doing? Oh, no, like this, and like the kid that recorded the video was like, honestly, I was just concerned about this person, because they seemed crazy. Yeah, right? <laughs> so that's the first part. Yeah. And I'm like, why are you even putting yourself in this mess? You should not be doing that. This isn't 1960. You're not Tonto from The Lone Ranger. So that's like number one in my mind. Number two is, there. there is a problem in higher education where a lot of kids are like, um virtue is it virtue signaling because they can you know there's such anonymity on social media where like what can i find that i can bring to people's attention and make and and feel like i'm making a difference even though all i'm doing is calling out somebody and and that's it ruin somebody's career i guess yeah because i she's at the very least on leave but yeah to that extent it's what can I record that'll go viral? And like, oh, this is gonna go viral. Look at this. And I'll chick. sit back and say, like, look what I did. And I think that's no that's no way to be in this world. It can't be that person. It's not worth it. Like the thing that really bothered me about the incident was just the Native American activist interview. It's like to put together a crazy person doing something stupid and to insinuate that because that person did something stupid, it was gonna harm people. Like Yeah. I think it probably did. It's like, that's what that activist, like, that's his job, really, right? Like, he's, his whole life, he's probably fought this whole idea that there's a stereotypical view of Native Americans, and I need to tell people that's not what it's like. So when he sees something new that obviously she knew from growing up watching The Lone Ranger or any kids show that we had where there were Indians, he's like, ugh. This will never go away. Uh, so I think he probably actually does have a point where it's just like, this is not the way Native Americans are. Can we please stop doing this? But yeah, to use a word like harm and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm with you in that it probably doesn't cause problems for people. But I, I also think like that guy who made the documentary about a poo. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. On yeah. The Simpsons. Like, he's got a point. People are walking around pretending that all Indians are working at Quickie Marts and they and they do this voice, thank you very much, and all that stuff. Like, that's got to be annoying. Oh, God know? damn it. Because, yeah, you're right. <laughs> like, that goes back to Temple of Doom and how much it fucked me up with Indian culture. Yeah, right. So I'm like, I do see their point, but I don't know. Like, do they, are they really, do they really care about that like it's harmful that's where i think that's a little much maybe it's like the constant activism where you constantly point out every time somebody does something wrong uh, the thing the, the there was like she should know better the kids are always virtue signaling and number three for me is that if if it's actually against your culture then i get why you would be upset but i think there's a majority of people that that they're offended on behalf of another culture <laughs> that's the problem <laughs> <laughs> that's the huge problem. That's where all this comes from. And that I assume that Native Americans are very offended by this. So I need to get on my bandwagon and talk about how horrible it is. So those are the three things for me where, where the far left is just off the mark. You're you're my therapy. You're helping me get better at understanding my feelings on this well i do think it's okay to talk about this stuff though you know it's true and it's we're all living in the same world and we're all using the same social media so i think anybody can have an opinion on it that's what we do we have opinions we do we do have opinions like this is just how you should live (laughs) ladies and gentlemen because teenage mutant Ninja turtles 3 really got us talking about this problem yes uh the Uh, the epic classic written and directed by Stuart gillard he has a long acting filmography like the 1971 classic the reincarnate and then following it up the next year as constable bill and the rowdy man and then he played diver phil bradley in the neptune factor and then why rock the boat question mark from 1974 he goes on to then act as phil talbot in f-i-s-t fist 
but it's an what do you call that when it's dots an acronym acronym fist oh and then he follows that up with virus threshold and then his last acting credit is the 1985 seminal work doing time without the g on doing no of course this could be anybody's filmography <laughs> why am i talking there, there by the grace of god how exactly did i just go into that guy's acting filmography when he directed teenage mutant ninja turtles part three and he is most known for also directing <laughs> the 1997 classic rocket man yes rocket man starring yeah. harlan williams made. yep yeah I don't know. Sometimes you just all of a sudden get a break and you're like, oh, you want to direct now? Okay, go ahead. It's like he graduated from all of these amazing acting credits. It's just who you know. I don't know. It's just who you know. Somebody He just knew somebody that gave him a shot. And, and it, he wrote this too, right? Didn't he write and direct this? He did write and direct yeah, this. So I don't know. He somehow, it might have started from that. Like maybe he was writing things and he got this job and then convinced him that like, well, I should direct it too. And it was all part of the deal. Do you think that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, Turtles in Time, even though that might not be the subheader? That's, people have like thrown that subtitle on it, but I don't think that's actually what it was called. Because there was a game called Turtles in Time. Do you think this was originally a period piece that they added Ninja Turtles to? <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good possibility. I respect the fact, the idea that they, or the, the attempt that they brought in Japanese culture into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles world. Because they owe a heavy debt to Japanese culture in these films. So I thought that was kind of cool. I was like, way to go. You know, as much as I jest about the director, this movie was fine. Totally fine. But totally very fine. forgettable very very forgettable it just ran the gamut of like oh yeah then they go here oh then they do this and then they do that yeah i mean it, it here's the plot right it's 1603 in uh, japan there's a emperor and his son is against him because the emperor just wants war so he's working with an american trader who's promising him weapons and i guess a fleet of ships or whatever yeah but i don't think it's ever clear who the war is against it's just i think there was he like he's he's a warlord leader so then there's been a rebellion population that has risen up to try to stop him so now i think that's where his war is where his eyes are on like i gotta collapse the rebellion it's kind of like star wars i guess but his son who is not down with his war with his warlord father's view is also in love with the leader of the rebellion so that's why the son is torn and then there's this guy named walker who's an american trader who's promising him weapons and ships so they, that's the Texas idea Ranger. right so that's the idea that's the whole film now that could have just been the forgettable martial arts film that made in japan that it could have been except yeah they were like well let's bring the turtles into this so it's been a little while after secret of the ooze the sequel and the turtles uh april buys them presents from an antique store which she used to own an antique store but i feel like it burned down she lived the above one. the antique yeah. store oh, oh no but her, her, but her uncle, father owned yeah it, yeah or her grandfather something like that so did they rescue the antique store or did she just go to another antique store? Because she's an antiquer. Maybe that's just, maybe we're reading into this. <laughs> I think she's just an antiquer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So she bought them presents, goofy things. But she bought a scepter because Splinter likes that old stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it starts lighting up and she gets transported back. So it's like some time machine or something. But you have to like trade the exact okay. space time with someone else. You have to populate their body. So then that son of the warlord gets sent to present-day New York, and April's back in 1603, Japan. I absolutely loved the time travel mechanic in this movie, and yeah. it was more creative than this movie deserved. Well, they put a little bit of science fact to it, um, like Jules Verne almost, as opposed to Independence Day. <laughs> It was like some guy that actually knew something was just like, how about we do the mass transfer in the time travel? And somebody else was like, why? Why can't we just send the turtles back in time? Well, it'll be a little more interesting this way. Like they have to embody the actual mass of someone from the past in order to transfer. Yeah, you're right. It, it I don't was know neat. why they did that. Why did they bother doing that? Who yes, they could have just been right. sucked back in time. So April's back there. Uh, of course, it's 1600, so they think she's a witch. She's obviously in trouble. The turtles realize, without knowing that she's in trouble, they just assume she's in trouble, that they need to go back. So then they end up taking the place of these of the honor guard of the warlord 
So now Casey Jones is brought back. He wasn't in the sequel. Wasn't in uh, Secret of the Ooze, but he comes yeah, back here. To watch all of the Japanese guys, the four guys that are now in present day while the turtles are back in the past. This movie is interesting because it does make some interesting choices. Having Casey Jones back, but having the actor also play a character in the past but he didn't do much in the past like he was very subdued which or I the thought present was very interesting <laughs> yeah the present he just had a small role where he had to watch these guys so mm. it was like comedic role he shows them hockey and they have a good time at a bar and stuff but in the past like he was so quiet i just thought that was really weird he was really trying to method act that role but nobody told him like this is just a turtles se- sequel like you don't you don't have to go all serious with this you could be goof <laughs> so it just is like the turtles like mikey gets separated the other three go and rescue april but they don't have the scepter uh but they do break out the casey jones from that time when they hook up with the rebellion they realize everything that's going on that she loves the son of the of the emperor and then like it turns out they have the the kid has the scepter as part of the rebellion so then Casey Jones in Japan like uh, double crosses them and gives the scepter to the American traitor. And then it all comes to a head where they battle the emperor, right? Am I missing anything important in between there? I got so lost in there and I don't think you are. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. There's more to it in that uh, Raphael like, uh, gets uh, to be friends with this kid that's part of the rebellion and he saves his life in a fire. So it's teaching him how to be a little, how to, he's like showing the kid how to control his own anger. And I think that was actually like kind of a character development for Raphael because Raphael is always the angry turtle. So there was a little bit of that in there. So I was like, all right, that's kind of cool. But yeah, they end up just fighting the emperor and they defeat him. And he realizes the error of his ways because his son loves the rebellion leader and he doesn't want to push his son away, I guess. So there's that. And then, yeah, they dispatch with the American trade who tried to leave with the scepter before he threw it in the air to try to escape but then he fell to his death so now they have the scepter back but mikey doesn't want to go back because he really this i actually liked mikey doesn't want to go back and i think Raphael's is with him because they aren't appreciated in new york and they have to hide but here in japan they felt like they didn't and it was a beautiful moment where i'm just like you're right you should stay but then they all go back anyways yeah and that's it and then splinter tries to uh cheer him up because they know that they're living in a sewer and they always will for the rest of their lives by putting the lampshade on his head and doing a little dance (laughs) that's it (laughs) anything else in there that we even need to talk about plot wise i mean you explained (laughs) that so much more than i was gonna i was gonna be like the turtles went back in time they fought a bad guy yeah and then they came back I you know the the plot is almost secondary. Like I think the things to talk about is uh, about the Jim Henson company not coming back. Yeah, it was so right. damn noticeable. Like you hadn't mm-hmm. watched it yet when we recorded the first episode. What were your thoughts on their outfits? It's very distracting. It was so distracting. Everything was fine about it except they just you could always see the seam where their head goes on. Like they didn't even try to hide it sometimes. It just looked awful. The, and the mouths. The yes. Mouths just did not match what they were saying. No, not at all. And I just, it was such a mistake. I don't, it, I'm assuming they just cheaped out and went yeah. with a cheaper company. Or maybe they didn't want anything to do with it. However, all the movies were hits. So even this one made a lot of money and debu- debuted at number debuted at number one just because it was a turtle film. But I think this is what and the first two were killed so the big. franchise. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. killed the franchise. Like they had so many directions they could have went after part two, where deciding to do a period time travel piece was so yeah. weird. Why did that happen? I don't know. But again, I do think that there was something in their mind where like we need to give some love to Japan, which where everything comes from, uh, the whole ninja idea. I'm s- thinking that Stuart Gillard had something very incriminating like he was he was filming doing time no i think he had something incriminating on new line yeah (laughs) they were like (laughs) like i bet you money don't tell anybody i'm looking up right now doing time was produced by new line (laughs) now warner brothers damn it and film corp oh wait film corp oh film corp existed as something and then it changed all right we'll never know you I'm know, this film watch. would be less forgettable if they made more after it. And then it would just been one of those fun little jaunts that these turtles went on. It's kind of like if, like, Temple of Doom was the last Indiana Jones movie. Oh, God. Like, that, that would have been the forgotten Indiana Jones one. No one would have cared. 
yeah, the like, fact that they made another one, then it became a trilogy and it became a big thing. Turtles obviously have a trilogy with this one, but I think they would have needed a fourth or a fifth, and then this would have just been like just a blip on the map. Fun little, yeah, yeah. fun little adventure one. Oh yeah, number three. Oh, that's where they go back to Japan, and then number four. Yeah, they're back in New York, and the Shredder's back or whatever. They bring Krang into it or something. Who knows? I know. Um, <laughs> do you have anything else you want to say about this movie? Because I want to kind of expand beyond this movie and talk about the history of the turtles past this. I don't think so. I think this is pretty much. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, movie's fine. Watch it once, but you'll never want to watch it again. So this has been a real trip down memory lane for both of us, and we've been exploring different segments of the Ninja Turtles universe. Now, there was an animated movie that came after this that was, quote-unquote, a continuation. You know more about this. Like, I would say, well, after, from what I read about the third one, they had a fourth one in mind, uh, but that mutated. <laughs> into their live action tv show that was called teenage mutant Ninja turtles the next mutation right and they brought in the female turtle yes so that's kind of what the fourth movie became but i don't i never watched the show because i was i was past turtles at that point it was like 97 maybe 98 something and like that. it was too much money for me to buy to revisit now so i just wasn't mm-hmm. gonna do it yeah i think that then the animated thing came in 2007 just simply called tmnt so wait and no i think that was still part of those com- that company so no the Next one was earlier. I think it was like 2002 when they launched the next one. I should actually look. Like a cartoon? Yeah. Yep. They had a cartoon that had a lot more involvement with the original creators of the comic. And this was pre-selling it to Nickelodeon. It was a bit darker and had some... It's so weird. Well, does the animated film tmnt does that come off of that show no or is that its own thing too its own thing which is so, so funny. the show didn't last like didn't do anything i guess so the show was so well this show again was my favorite part well in the middle they sold to nickelodeon and nickelodeon is responsible for a lot of the reboots after that yeah but they didn't do the tmnt animated film yes they did oh they did yes no, i don't think so really I'm, I feel like the animated film came out and then it was sold to Nickelodeon. 87% then... sure that... Okay. Yeah. But no, so this next iteration, the next cartoon was a bit darker and it was off the wall. Like for a while, the turtles were living in the future and fighting bad mm. guys in the future. Is this where the turtles yes! forever thing Yes, and it from? all oh, okay. ends yeah. with this beautiful movie that I bought that I just loved <laughs> um, called Turtles Forever, okay. where there is a... The Technodrome from the original cartoon Mm -hmm. causes a rift in time, causing the turtles from that cartoon to meet the original turtles from the original cartoon, and they are battling the original Shredder and Krang, and the original Shredder and Krang bring back the new Shredder, who is just whatever. And we have this just epic battle where the new shredder wants to destroy the turtles forever because he hates them and so they knowing that there's a multiverse of different turtles go to the original turtle universe turtle prime to destroy that and if they destroy that they're going to destroy all the other universes like the comic and turtle prime is the comics so they get there and it's black and white and the turtles are there and they're all interacting they got narration it was the (laughs) best piece of fan service that i've ever seen and it was to this point, the best usage of the multiverse that I've ever seen. Isn't it funny how many multiverses we've discovered throughout uh, the 20th century that, you know, like Marvel and DC get all the credit for doing them currently in their movies, but they've been done before. They've been done before. And it may have been DC in the 80s with the whole infinite crisis on or crisis on infinite Earths. I think that that might have been the first multiverse thing. But maybe there was something before that. I'm on Amazon right now. I don't know why. But frequently bought together. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles Forever. The Ninja Turtles, The Next Mutation, the live action show. And then the complete series for the original cartoon, 4149. That's not too bad. I'm surprised it's not on streaming. It's on streaming, but you just have to pay more. What is the name of the girl turtle? Mm. Um, Renoir? But I... uh, (laughs) I don't know. Van Gogh? I'm sure it was one of them. 
worth noting the TMNT movie you're talking about from 2007. Chris Evans plays Casey Jones. Sarah Michelle Gellar plays April O'Neil. It's not a, it's not a sequel to, but it like it totally could be just because the idea is that the Shredder has been defeated and that's the, the jumping off point. Oh, we defeated the Shredder and now the turtles are like splintered. <laughs> no pun intended. A lot of puns in this. <laughs> the three of them are together, but Leo gets sent to like South America to like train. Like Splinter sent him there. And Splinter's actually portrayed as more of a sensei in this cartoon, which I thought was kind of cool. So he's got more of a, a dojo mindset for the place. But like Mikey is just a pizza delivery guy who wears like a big turtle head. He just wears it, which I thought was kind of funny because he wears it over his turtle head. And uh, the other guys are just kind of goofing around. I can't remember what they do. Like Donatello. Oh, Donatello is working for like a tech company or something, you know, over like uh, virtually or uh, remotely. Makes sense. Yeah. And anyway, so Patrick Stewart voices the big bad, who's this warlord from 3000 years ago that tried to take over the world, but he failed. So all of his friends were turned into stone. And now he's been cursed with immortality. So now he's lived forever and he's become like this big multi-billionaire businessman or whatever, who's finally brought all of the monsters in the world together. And it'll give him the power to finally take over the world, but also free his friends from the stone. That's pretty much it. But the twist of the movie is that once he gets all of his friends back, they want to take over the world, which they assume he does too. But he's like, no, I'm telling you guys, we need to stop. I was wrong. We need to all die and we need to all go away. So then they turn on him. So Patrick Stewart turns out to be in a little twist, actually to help the turtles at the end when he thought he was going to be the big bad (laughs) guy. So then they all have to come together and and learn how to be brothers again and fight the big sky laser. They even give April O'Neil like a superhero costume and Casey's taught her how to kick ass and then they're kicking ass together and... It wasn't bad. It was a pretty good film, I thought, actually. It was pretty dark. Yeah, I was totally wrong. This was 2007. Nickelodeon bought them in 2009, killing any hopes of a sequel. The cartoon you you're go. talking about That's what had a budget of $30 million, made about $90 million. So it was a big success. I'm still shocked. I've never seen this, but Sarah Michelle Ge- Geller, Chris Evans before he was famous, Patrick Stewart, Kevin Smith... As an unnamed cook? I knew it was him, too. Like, he just has a small little role where the turtles bust in. And, and like, Raphael is this character called the Night yeah. Watchman or something. He's this hooded, uh, wears armor, and nobody knows who he is, even though he obviously looks like a turtle, but nobody knows it's him. And, and that's a surprise because Leo tries to take down the Night Watchman because he thinks he's just a vigilante. And So there's a lot of good brother drama going on. So I think the film, it was darker. It was cool. It's just with the whole 3,000-year-old emperor and the sky laser. It's just... It's just- it wasn't turtles. Right. It was not street level enough to be that great in my mind. But it was cool. Patrick Stewart, like they brought people and Lawrence in Fishburne who as did the narrator. Quality. Yeah, you know he's the one to fill in all that information at the beginning, three thousand years ago. And then Nickelodeon <laughs> buys them, and then they yeah. reboot them with the Michael Bay travesty films, and and those are even like fun at times, but. The overall, they're just that madness, cl- like the transformers. That movie. clip you sent me was so bad, I will never yeah. watch them ever. Like that just looked like yeah. hot junk. Well, it it's like the faces of the turtles. They just I don't know what they were thinking. Like they they were not attractive. Like to look at, like it was disturbing. They look like monsters. Yeah. Like so, this this film could actually serve as a good bookend for like the first the last good chapter of the Ninja Turtles and what we have in yeah, the future, unless they give it to somebody that's going to blossom into some creative awesomeness well if there's one thing we know about the turtles is that they will never go away no matter how many crappy things they get made they always come back and that is the power of this franchise well and that's the thing that surprised me is we had grown out of it obviously but looking back at it there is a lot of quality here like yeah. i'm happy with everything that i saw like uh, and even the worst one was fine and they did creative and inventive things what a fluke like these two guys just coming up with this silly ninja turtle thing i mean it's out outli- it's gonna outlive them. oh yeah weird it's weird and- 40 years now it's just been going i just hope they're still making money off it like i hate when you sell a property and george lucas goes and sells star wars and for four billion and then they make a billion billion more and well i saw a documentary in that like one of them bought out of it but the other guy was still involved and still was like creative overseer of it but I, maybe that's even changed now since i saw that documentary like maybe now that nickelodeon owns it he's not part of it anymore i don't really know do you have anything you want to talk about the ninja turtles anymore are you good no all right so to wrap it up I've been revisiting Star Trek very heavily lately. Yeah. I have 
went through and I rewatched all of the movies from start to finish, and some of them I had never seen. Part six is a quiet classic. Yeah, isn't it great? It's amazing. You know what? It's Nick Rowe. Uh, not Nick Rowe. <laughs> Nick, um, Nicholas, somebody who directed, wrote and directed it, because he did The Wrath of Khan. Yes, and then yes, he they brought him back. Four, yep. Because the way they talk about the original series, at least, uh, of movies, is that every other one is good. Right. So number two was good. Number three, eh. Number four is good, eh, you know, to number five. And then six, it's always this guy. Like, he's the brains behind it. Yeah. And I read his book that he wrote about working on Star Trek. So it was, it was pretty good. Really? Yeah. A lot of insight. Yeah. See, that would be really interesting. Like, you know what I love? It's so fucking poetic, and I had no idea until I watched the movie. The title, The Undiscovered Country. For those of you who haven't seen Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country just means the future. And so, like, it's just a nice bookend to the original cast, and it's awesome. Well, do you know that that was going to be the original title of The Wrath of Khan? Really? It would have been Star Trek II, The Undiscovered Country. Really? Yeah, but they decided against it, and then he finally got to use it on the sixth movie i i love that title six has a bunch uh the next generation was running at that point and so like half of the sets were just repurposed the next generation sets Mm -hmm. michael dorn shows up playing a different klingon which that awesome (laughs) so awesome he was a klingon lawyer (sighs) <sighs> and uh aman uh is in it yes she's the beautiful actress uh who ended up marrying david bowie who was married to david bowie at that time so yeah yeah and she's like a shapeshifter right and oh and they have that fun scene where she becomes shatner and he gets to like find himself <laughs> it's so dorky but i love that scene it's really good it was so good and and uh what's his name is in it um shakespearean actor you know he plays the klingon uh, i'm blanking out here i'm blanking completely he was in S- sound of music Oh, you mean DeForest have... Kelly? No, no, no. He may have just <gasps> oh. died. Oh, sorry. Not too long ago. Um, I think he did die not too long ago. Come on. You me mean uh, Walter Koning? No. Nichelle Nichols? <laughs> He's not one of the cast members. Kim so. Cattrall is in it. Oh, Christopher <laughs> Plummer. Christ. Christopher Plummer. Thank yes. you. Yeah, Plummer's in it. He's great in it. Uh, so I went and saw William Shatner on a live tour. I saw it in Chicago years ago, and he, it was called, Sh- it's Shatner's World, We're Just Living in It, and he was a one-man show that he put on at a theater, but he talked about his time on Star Trek, amongst other things, and he and Chris Plummer were in a Shakespearean company together, like, in the 60s, so it was kind of poetic for them to be in a Star Trek movie later on in life. That's actually pretty awesome, yeah. I don't, yeah, there's a lot to like about the sixth one, and I thought it was a nice fitting end, although I don't, I don't mind Generations, I thought Generations was a good film as well, and it was a nice way to put them together, but it just felt very anticlimactic, having him and Picard fight, what's his name at the end, and how he died, and I don't know, just kind of ended blah for me. Yeah, it has a blah ending, and... But seeing the Enterprise crash was amazing. Yes. I loved that part. It was good. And, uh, but the problem was, once they lost that old design for that Enterprise, now you're left with a early 2000s or late 90s like now we have a cool enterprise the enterprise e and it just like it didn't it doesn't last like the the look of it didn't yeah the, last for me. the e was just fine like it yeah yeah it, we didn't have it enough too slick we didn't have enough That's time to hang out with it no because it was pretty much over by like oh two right because they did he first contact which is an amazing Star Trek movie I love that one then they did Insurrection and Nemesis and that was pretty much it for the crew yeah and yeah Nemesis is surprisingly good yeah I, I don't know if I loved it but it wasn't it wasn't bad looking back and never having seen it before yeah there's so many things to like and then I just watched the first season of Picard and you know you had some mixed feelings on the yeah. portrayal but I I liked it a lot. I mean, I'm with you that he is in his 90s, so he definitely would mellow, but I don't know. I was coming off watching The Next Generation, and like everything, every Picardism, like he just doesn't, he kind of dropped it all. I feel like he's just playing a nice Patrick Stewart and not Captain Picard anymore, and that's just what got to me. Like the interesting thing might that I'm looking for, <sighs> I had a couple problems with Picard after we talked. The ethical dilemma of him being in a new body. I feel like Picard would have a real hard time yes. with that. Right. Like, explain that. His body, he had a disease and he was dying the whole time through the episode yeah. or the season. 
And yes, right. It was supposed to be his last hurrah mission to save this girl. And that's why I'm kind of wondering if we'll see a little more of the traditional Picard in season two now that he's healthy. Mm-hmm. Well, he always had that fake heart. I remember that from The Next Generation. And he calls it out like when somebody's going to shoot him in the heart. And he's like, you're going to have to aim somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's right. I totally forgot that part. So he is like in a cloned body now. I... <sighs> Something like that? I think he's in an AI. Or he's in a data body, I think. Oh, okay. I guess I'd have to rewatch it, which I won't. But (laughs) whatever. I'll figure it out in the second season. It sounds like Song was... They were working on mind transference to uh, artificial bodies. And, I mean, the bodies were like pretty much real but i'm wondering if picard is going to have super strength in season two now this is exactly this is exactly what happened to professor x ironically played by patrick stewart in the movies but yeah (laughs) professor x in the comics died but he had a clone body that he was put into yeah no i think they specifically (laughs) said they made the body frail and not special but that he would live out his natural life and then picard's like well i wouldn't have mind an extra 10 years (laughs) that's where i feel like old picard I actually probably would have minded. Just the Picard who was always like, didn't like kids and had didn't suffer fools much and got frustrated. I just missed that Picard. I don't know where he was in Patrick Stewart. He mellowed too much. That's all I was at. Too much. But I am, what I'm hoping for the second season, because we'll definitely watch it. I liked it, is uh, I would love to see the Enterprise. I feel like they should bring it back. But And now is their chance, because it's been a number of years, that they could say like, oh, this is now the Enterprise F. Or whatever, you know, like there's a new one because the other one was obsolete. So now they'll have another chance to make a better design yeah. than what they were left with on the rest of the other And they did, they did the timeline pretty good. Like the last movie was like 2002. They said it's basically... Yeah, so it'd been a good 15 years or whatever, yeah. right? Something like that. Like, yeah. yeah, he had left the Enterprise a while ago. So that insinuated that he was like 75 for the last movie. Yeah. So uh, thanks, everybody. It was great uh, talking about the Ninja Turtles. I'm Justin. I'm Aaron. And uh, stay tuned for more cool stuff. Talk to you then. Yeah. Bye-bye. All right, bye.